your talk today about the power of half, which um, is a story of optimism. I'd like to introduce you to our family. On the left is our son Joseph. He's a freshman at Westminster here in Atlanta. On the right is the girl standing next to me. That's Hannah. She's a junior at the Atlanta Girls' School. And my wife and I are in the middle. That's Joan and Kevin. And a little bit of background about us. Joan's from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, we are the children of four school teachers. And I say that only to position this a little bit as, so that you understand there's no big trust fund here. There's no, um, you know, we're not trust fund babies. We earned the money that we got. The way we did that, we got good educations. We worked very hard. We got a little bit lucky. And we made more money than many people do. Now, I said this is a story of optimism. I want to introduce you to uh, Hannah here as a baby and her great-grandma, Esther King. Now, it could have been quite different from a story of optimism. Esther King um, was not exactly the world's most uh, upbeat and optimistic person. And so, uh, one quick example, beautiful sunny spring day in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. She's taken out um, by her son on a, in her wheelchair. They're walking, they're going through the botanical gardens. Her son says to her, Mom, isn't this a lovely day? Look at those beautiful flowers. And her response was, one good hailstorm, wipe them all out. <laughs> now, there were moments when we wondered whether Hannah was going to have a similar disposition, or at least pretend to, much to the chagrin of her mother and embarrassment. Joe and I grew up knowing that my parents um, wanted the best for us. Um, we were living the American dream, and behind us is my mom's dream house. Um, it was built in 1912, built for the rich family, um, has a working elevator, huge backyard, um, and a, a room for a nanny to live. Our parents um, always gave us plenty, and most of the time we didn't even appreciate it. Um, we were given music lessons. And here I'm in the Bahamas parasailing with a friend on one of our crazy vacations. Unfortunately, we were losing our core. In our big house, we were scattering to parts far and wide, losing our communication. In our car, the kids would watch TV in the back, once again, missing out a chance for connection and communication. It's a little bit like a tidal, a, a uh, erosion on a shore. It's not a tidal wave. There's no trauma. There's no big event. It's just the steady clicking away of the relationship. And that's what we began to realize. When Hannah was about 11, the four of us crawled into bed, and we read this book, The Alchemist. Now, I don't know how many people here have read it, but it's a fable about the journey of a shepherd who goes looking for his, as it's called in the book, personal legend. In other words, why am I on this planet? And what, at the end of the book, Joan looked up and she said, hmm, could we possibly have a family legend? In other words, why are we on this planet? So in 2006, when I was 14, um, the big event happened. Um, I was riding in the car with my dad on the way home from a sleepover so on a Sunday morning, and we stopped at a really familiar stoplight to us. And um, I looked to my left, and I saw a homeless man sitting, a, a really typical scene that you would see here in Atlanta, um, holding up a sign that said, homeless, please help. And then I looked to my right, and I saw a man in a Mercedes coupe. And I was kind of toggling back and forth between the have and the have-nots, and I said to my dad, you know, if that guy to my right didn't have such a nice car, then the homeless man to my left could have a meal. And my dad, you know, thought about it for a second and said, you know, but if we didn't have such a nice car, then the man could have a meal. So that night when we went home, um, we were talking to my mom and my brother about um, the event that had happened, and I, I was feeling really angry. And I was, I was upset because I knew that I could do more than I was doing. And I knew that our family could do more than we were doing. Um, and I said, you know, I don't want to be the type of family that just like sits around and says, I wish that we could do something. I wish that we had the power to do that. I want to really get out there and do something good. 
So my mom, kind of in a fit of frustration, um, said, what do you want to do? You want to sell our house? And I said, yeah, yeah, that is what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> so that is what we decided to do. We decided to sell our house and move into one half its size and donate uh, half the sales price to a charity. From this brief moment of insanity, <laughs> developed what we, ter what we term in our family as the process, largely crafted by my wife, Joan. We knew with this large amount of money, which by the way, we'll lay it out here for you, it's $800,000, okay, that we didn't want to screw it up, okay? It was the house we were gonna sell. It was Joan's dream house. And we wanted to make sure that we did this properly. And it's a responsibility to know how to give away money correctly. We started with the very biggest questions. Do we want to help a few people a lot? In other words, possibly take, helping two homeless Atlantans move their lives completely through to pr productivity? Or did we want to help a lot of people a little? In other words, maybe providing thousands of vaccines. We did a very interesting thing. And I, was, I will say that I was opposed to it at first. Joan said over that we're going to have a long research period in which we figure out exactly how to invest our money. And if the kids are going to feel that they own this project, because after all, they're giving up their rooms and their home too, they have to have just as much say as the adults. One person, one vote. Now, I didn't exactly feel great about this. Teens can be irrational and occasionally uh, hormonal and all the things that you expect of teens. And um, I didn't really think that power sharing was of such a great idea. But Joan insisted, and I agreed we'd try it. And she said, oh, by the way, Kevin, we can always kind of try to overrule them anyway. We'll vote as a block. So we decided, in the end, to work um, in Ghana, Africa. And, um, well, why, you know? Why not work in the US? Well, it's for three reasons. First of all, we were already working in the US. We work um, in, our com in our local community uh, all the time. Um, I work at the Central Night Shelter, the, the food bank. My dad works for Habitat. Um, and um, also, our money could go further um, overseas. We could maybe start and finish a project, and we could feel like our money was really going somewhere. And also, the third reason is um, there is no safety net. And what I mean by safety net is, well, this. Um, there is no soup kitchens or food pantries. There is no health care. Um, this is essentially where they live. I mean, it is where they live. And um, so they, there's no, if they need help, there's really nowhere to go. Another decision we made during this process was that the world didn't need us to create another nonprofit. There were plenty of really smart people doing very good work overseas. And all we needed to do was to get on the right train. So we spent that year trying to figure out exactly which nonprofit organization to team with. We decided to team with an organization headquartered out of New York called The Hunger Project. And we decided to join with them for several reasons. Number one is, their concept is grassroots empowerment of people to make change in their own lives. In other words, the Africans are the authors of their own future. It's a five-year program that moves from poverty to self-reliance, that helps people move from poverty to self-reliance. Five years, very patient capital. It's not dropping food, it's not dropping bed nets, it's patient capital. And the last thing is that it it's focuses on empowering women to be the agents of change in these communities. One of the other elements of it that really mattered to us is that we did not want to be in the same boat as a number of the Western concepts of, we're from the West, we're here to tell you what to do. Or worse, we're here from the West, we're here to do it for you, okay? You all know that concept of, you know, if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. The Hunger Project believes the man already knows how to fish. The man could teach you how to fish. 
the man doesn't have the resources to be able to fish. And by the way, the man's probably a woman. So you might wonder, uh, what did we do while we were there? Because we weren't exactly um, hands-on. So we really, well, the main thing that we did was we supported. Uh, we danced badly. Um, we spoke to um, a lot of Africans. And um, we encouraged them to build a future for their children. Um, here I am with a bunch of African children. We call this picture FTO, find the Obruni, or white person. <laughs> we had time to model Adinkra dresses. And um, can anybody guess what this is? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> a gas station. We visited the coolest gas station I'd ever been to. And can anybody guess what this is? Yeah, the biggest termite hill we'd ever seen. And we also got to visit the awesome Ghanaian countryside. And the painful Elmina slave castles where hundreds of thousands of slaves were um, put before they were shipped to the New World. It was very tiring. <laughs> but for the locals, it was thrilling. Um, here we are at a, um, a corn mill opening. And um, we're at a bisu celebrating this new corn mill. Um, they used this corn mill to grind up their corn to make kenke, which was one of their um, main foods. And um, the importance of this mill is really um, to, to make sure that the the children, mainly the girls, don't have to walk five miles round trip each day to get their corn milled, and instead it could be done right here, and those girls can actually go to school. So as crazy as that is, this corn mill means um, education for their girls. For us as the parents during this process, what blew us away was how much it helped our children mature and become leaders. What you don't see in this photograph, uh, and this is a picture, by the way, of Hannah, speaking about the importance of primary education to about 400 people, more than 20 tribal chiefs, including the chief called the Obohene, who runs 278 villages. And yes, this was such an important speech that Superman did show up. <laughs> but the, the amazing thing that it did for our family as we did this was it brought us a new level of connectedness, of communication, of trust. We set out to make a small difference in the world, as Hannah said, and what we ended up doing was transforming ourselves. I just want to give you a, a, just one quick example. In our old house, the big house, we had this big basement, and so that's where we put the ping pong table. But nobody ever thought about it. We rarely ever went down there. In the new house, we looked around, we said, where the heck are we going to put the ping pong table? We don't have a basement. So we'll just kind of stick it in the middle of the house. We now play six or seven times a week, and it's brought our family together. Our book tells the story of our family's own half project, but also it um, guides others through their own. Um, so we don't expect someone, anyone, to sell their house. I mean, that's kind of a ridiculous thing to do, and that was something that we thought we could handle doing. Um, but everyone does have something that they could afford to give away. Um, for example, if your family watches four hours of TV a week, maybe you could cut that down to two, and with those other two hours, do something mean meaningful in your community. So here are some ideas up here. Um, maybe instead of taking a vacation, you can have a staycation and donate the money to the Ronald McDonald House. Or um, spend half the money you spend on iTunes and um, help people with disabilities, especially deafness. Um, you could reduce the amount of caffeine that you drink, Coke or coffee, and um, donate to um, an organization that helps people um, with addictions. Um, you could have <laughs> you could um, have half the amount of dental cleanings you have a year go from two to one, and uh, donate to Operation Smile. Um, you could buy half the amount of cosmetics that you buy and donate to a girl's self-esteem program. Or you could donate, donate half of your hair to Lux of Love. These are just ideas that we've come up with, and I'm sure you know, there are tons of awesome ideas out there, so you can come up with your own. Yeah, as, as Hannah says, really, we, we've come up with a few ideas, but the collective wisdom of crowds is amazing. And so everyone can look introspectively into their own lives, figure out what they have just enough of, and say, wait a second, I could do with less of that. 
and I could make the world a little bit better. It's funny, on, on Wednesday, um, we were having a conversation with CBS Sunday Morning, and, and um, the, the, the uh, correspondent said to my wife, okay, I understand how a, a then 14-year-old girl could come up with this feeling of disparity and this feeling of anger over that, but why would you, as a mother, go along with it? And Joan said, because she's right. Because the fact of the matter is, we have half a house, we're living very well, and we're providing opportunity for over 40 villages in Africa to have more chance to live a better life. That for us is the power of half. And what we essentially did in our lives is we traded stuff for togetherness and connectedness. And I'm willing to bet that that's a deal that a whole lot of people would take. I thank you for your time. Thank you.